Hello and welcome to the final lecture in the landscape and cultures element of the Who Do You Think You Are module, focusing on the case study of Honduras. This week we will be exploring what is happening in modern Honduras and the relationship between the landscape and the cultures, the violent culture that is forming there as a result of what happened during the Banana Republic and the colonial uh, empire. So in the last lecture, I discussed about how American corporations had stripped Honduras and exploited Honduras of its limited resources and what effect that had had on the economy and society in Honduras. Now, the problems that we, I talked about in the last lecture are enormously exacerbated by a series of ecological and natural disasters in the last 20 years. I mentioned in the first lecture that Honduras is a country third in the world most affected by climate change. So these issues are only going to continue to get worse. Um, in 1998, a devastating hurricane hit Latin America, but it really hit Honduras the hardest. Um, this hurricane is the second deadliest Atlantic hurricane on record, and 7,000 Hondurans died within a week. Um, you have extraordinary statistics from Hurricane Mitch. 36 inches of rainfall fall in five days, more than half a year of average rainfall. As a result of this, you have a series of um, landslides that destroy the roads and houses in the countryside. 35,000 homes destroyed, one and a half million left homeless. Um, of course, it is difficult to estimate these kind of things, but most economic models suggest that the country was pushed back as much as 50 years in terms of economic development as a result of this. 70% of transportation infrastructure that was built during um, the Banana Republic and one of the few positives to come out of it was destroyed. 70% lose access to water. So it is not just the initial devastation, but the knock-on effect of Hurricane Mitch is absolutely catastrophic. It is difficult to emphasize how bad this was. But it's not just Hurricane Mitch. If you Google Honduras hurricanes, if you look below me at the regularity of cyclones or hurricanes, hitting the country. And it is no coincidence that as global warming gets worse, more and more hurricanes are hitting Honduras. And what happens is the economy never has a chance to recover. And it just keeps getting damaged every couple of years. This has also been made worse by deforestation. So I spoke a lot in the last lecture about how bananas and then coffee was used and exploited by American corporations for political gain. Well, by 2006, the president of Honduras was a man called Manuel Zelaya. And the reason that he was able to become president of Honduras is that he was from a wealthy logging and timber family who uh, and timber companies from America and throughout Latin America were able to back him and his presidential campaign. When he became president, um, the deforestation efforts in Honduras ramped up. And even before he had come into his presidency, deforestation had massively increased in the decade and a half previously. Between 1990 and 2005, Honduras had lost 40% of its rainforest, and it's mainly because of Zelaya's family. And 85% of that de deforestation was illegal. So it's not just the loss of the natural habitat 
that is a problem, people's jobs are lost as well. So Zelaya is an extension of the Banana Republic and these corrupt politicians who are backed by companies systematically taking out the resources of the country and selling it abroad. Zelaya's tenure is also important because it highlights the continued political instability and foreign intervention. Zelaya, despite making money for foreign backers, actually makes enemies within the Honduran military itself. And Zelaya is ousted in a military coup and literally taken from the country and taken to Costa Rica by the military, essentially creating a military dictatorship. And once again, um, this reign is um, backed by America uh, and replaced with an Obama-supported candidate. So you continue to see this foreign intervention and a lack of autonomy granted to the Honduran people. On top of the constant hurricanes, on top of the politically corrupt deforestation campaign by Zelaya, you have something else that happens, an ecological disaster, which, may, which has a catastrophic effect on Honduran society and employability. By 2010, um, 12, between 12 and 15 percent of the entire GDP of Honduras is through coffee beans and exporting coffee beans to Europe and North America. Um, unfortunately, because of the conditions of global warming, the increased rainfall, increased temperatures, viruses uh, and funguses thrive. And what happens if a devastating um, fungus emerges specifically in Honduras? And it's called La Roya fungus. La Roya roughly translating to leaf rust. And it means that the coffee um, plants cannot grow uh, coffee beans anymore. And worse than that, it destroys the soil in which the plants grow. And it takes three years for that soil to be able to grow, grow coffee plants again. So for the poverty stricken workers of Honduras, huge numbers of them were involved in coffee production. And all of a sudden that is taken away from them. In 2013 alone, 400,000 jobs within the coffee sector at lost. Two million uh, jobs on top of that are made borderline economically unviable. So as a result of the lack of coffee coming out of Honduras, other markets take that over and Brazil becomes the dominant coffee exporter in Latin and South America. So all of a sudden, after the gold and silver had been taken from the country, um, you have during the colonial period, the banana republic happens, deforestation happens, and one of the few industries that people can work in is taken away from them. So you can see how in recent years the situation in Honduras is made much worse. As a result of these issues that I've been discussing to do with the landscape and the climate in Honduras, which is intricately linked to the political uh, systems and the corruption that exists there and foreign intervention, you have a rise in environmental and political activism that is taking place in Honduras, especially in the last 10 or 15 years. However, to combat that, you also have a rise in the murders of environmental activists. And in the last couple of years, there have been um, a number of really high profile ones. In the first lecture, I mentioned Berta Caceres, who in 2016 was uh, killed as she openly opposed a hydroelectric a dam in La, Asper La Esperanza. Um, more recently, as recently as December 2020, Felix Vasquez, who was an indigenous Lenka, so hopefully you remember from the first lecture, 
the Lenka population was the original population of Honduras, and he supported Lenkan rights and campaigned against the deforestation where lots of people lived. In December 2020, a mass gunman kills him in front of his family, shoots him seven times in front of his children. So you can see that this hyper-masculine violence um, that is presumably linked to the political elite of the country is so prevalent. And as environmental issues get worse and people campaign against these environmental issues, the violence continues to be mirrored in that. Um, in 2019 alone, 14 environmental activists are murdered. So they are being specifically targeted and female activists in particular um, experience if not high levels of sexual violence. So even if they're not murdered, there is this fear campaign and gendered based violence in Honduras is particularly prevalent. And this continues to get worse under the current Honduran leadership. Um, Juan Orlando Hernandez really represents everything that is wrong in Honduras at the moment. Um, he was elected uh, in his, when he was elected, sorry, he was projected to get 18% of the vote, but he actually gets 66% of the vote. And it is widely recognized that his um, his election was massively fraudulent. Since he has been in charge and is backed by the US, um, he was big friends with Donald Trump, unsurprisingly. Um, and since then, he has continued to systematically asset strip what is left of Honduras. And at this point, you must be wondering what is even left to take from Honduras? There's no gold and silver. The forests have been much reduced. Um, the coffee plantations and the bananas have lost their influence due to various disasters. So what Juan Orlando Hernandez does, he's privatizing public institutions. So the healthcare system of Honduras is being sold to foreign investors. Education systems are being privatized and sold to foreign investors, as well as transportation. And money just keeps disappearing under Juan Orlando Hernandez. Um, he takes millions out of the healthcare system to fund his presidential campaign, his second presidential campaign, sorry, and his to just um, line his own pockets. Millions from the, the National Bank goes missing after he liquidates it. His sister is made of head of communications and government strategy. His tenure has been dictated by um, nepotism, him promoting his family interests. And his brother was actually arrested in the US for drug trafficking. Um, he used the Honduran military to move vast amounts of cocaine and marijuana through Honduras and get it to the US. Um, using military ships and planes to do so. Juan Orlando and his sister are massively, massively and clearly implicated in this as well. So Juan Orlando basically represents a lot of the things I've been discussing in the last few lectures. A weak politician backed by foreign powers who grants money to big corporations to strip anything of value from Honduras. So this is a process that is still going on to this day. And obviously, as a result of this, there are massive social and economic um, implications for the uh, working class of Honduras. And um, Orlando Hernandez is very, he's, popular in parts of the Honduran population because he is an evangelical Christian and he has these religious, conservative, religious and social values. And in the last few months alone, he has reintroduced 
strict laws to oppress minority groups within Honduras, including uh, making same-sex marriage illegal. It was always frowned upon, but it is made completely illegal, illegal now. The act of homosexual sodomy is illegal. Abortion is illegal. And when you think of the levels of sexual violence, there is an enormous amount of women who become pregnant as the result of rape and abortions are now illegal. So women, gay people, transsexual people, um, there's huge oppression, not just socially, but judicially in the law of Honduras. So there is a real rise in violence against these groups as a result of these laws. But it's not just um, minority groups or women that he attacks. It is certain public professions as well, educated people who might um, be against him. And as I've already mentioned, money is systematically stripped from public services, including the healthcare system, but also education. Um, when I was there in 2013, teachers had been without pay for two years because an uneducated population is a placid population and one that is unlikely to rebel against the political leadership. Uh, on the worst day of violence, um, when teachers protested, 17 were killed. And you have to remember, this is a US-backed government. And the US backed them because of the money that is made for big American businesses. And the attacks on the educated are indicative of some of the worst regimes the world have ever seen, including um, the Kamal Rouge and um, in Stalin's Soviet Russia. So an uneducated population who cannot access education means you have this perpetual cycle of people who are powerless. And it all comes as a result of the stripping of natural resources and how that has led to the stripping of public services. And it's really difficult to get an understanding of quite how bad the situation is. It's obviously awful, but it is probably significantly worse than we even know about. And that is because of media censorship. Um, the politicians who want to keep giving power to corporations silence media. And Honduras has some of the highest rates of journalist murder in the world. Between 2001 and 2017, 70 journalists are killed. Um, after the military coup on Zelaya, who I spoke about earlier, his replacement, his brief replacement, Lobo Sosa, uh, killed 10 prominent journalists within a year and was still backed by Obama, who is someone we see as liberal and uh, against these sort of things. Um, the slide that I've included on this, the picture on current side as uh, an infamous incident of a famous Honduran um, journalist called Cesar Silva. And um, shortly after this picture, um, he's attacked, stabbed and shot. He actually survives the incident, but it's shocking and kind of went viral and the rest of the world saw this. But anyone, it's not just people who protest, it's people who broadcast the protests as well. So it's really difficult to get a hold of how bad the situation really is. Um, and Silva himself has wrote about how he was once kidnapped and tortured by government officials and the military. So as public services are being stripped um, of their assets and people are not paid for many years, as people can no longer work in um, the coffee plantations, these forms of legal income are slowly being taken away. And that drives people in, through sheer desperation into illegal forms of income because the money doesn't trickle down. These corporations and politicians keep it in this two-class system. So 
people end up going into illegal forms of income. And the main one in Honduras is drugs. And dr the drug trade and the control of the drug trade is completely controlled by the military and gangs. And there's a strange dichotomy because the military and local militia um, are taking bribes and allowing the drug trafficking to continue. But they also have to put on this public display um, of cracking down on violence. So huge numbers of people are being arrested, even though the drug trade is um, government sanctioned. In fact, President Hernandez was recently caught saying that he wanted to shove as much cocaine up the noses of gringos as possible. So it's clear the government is part of this, but um, they, they still crack down and arrest drug dealers. Um, and the gangs obviously breed hyper-masculinity and competitiveness. Um, and drugs and arrests for drug-related offences have spiralled in the last few years as Hernandez tries to put this public image that he's tackling the situation. In February this year alone, 359 prisoners are killed in prison in Honduras. Um, and these prisons have become utterly lawless. The police have very little influence on what happens inside them. And the prisoners actually run drug rackets from them. You have brothels inside the prison. And these brothels, the sex trade and trafficking sex is often one of the few uh, forms of income women have at this point. So it's it's a grim situation. And on the bottom right of your screen, you have uh, do not. Danley Prison, which I actually spent a few days at when I was there in 2013, and it's over 150% over capacity. So they're very violent places um, where police have no control. And obviously, all of these social and economic issues that are a result of the systematic stripping of the landscape of Honduras create a situation in which most average day everyday people don't want to live in. The violence and gender-based violence specifically seen in Honduras creates a situation which people don't want to be a part of. And this has led to a migration crisis. Some people also want to leave because of the increasing number of natural disasters that are happening there. So people want to find a better life. 65% of Honduras is in extreme poverty. So the vast majority of people have not got a working wage. And the image you see on the top left of your screen, um, you're getting these massive caravans of people, as they're known as, trying to get out of Honduras and make their way to America. I've included um, the average journey of these people on the top right. And you're talking about thousands of people. This is this really played in to Donald Trump's idea that there is an invasion of Latin Americans into America was not acknowledging that America have created this issue over the past hundred years. Um, the Banana Republic and these economic issues, these weak politicians backed by American companies is all as a result of foreign intervention. So it's a bleak situation and it's been a bleak situation for many centuries now. I've put my uh, concluding points on this slide for you to have a look at. Um, but what I want to talk about in the seminar is I've already given you one reading um, for the Banana Republic, but I also want you to watch uh, the ABC News documentary uh, part one of two documentaries called Honduras, the most dangerous place to be a woman. And I'll put the YouTube link on this, but I'll also put a, uh, the link on Moodle, along with a number of other very interesting documentaries about the violence we see in Honduras. But make sure you watch that one, at least before the seminar, and think about the following questions. Number one, what ecological and natural disasters have recently taken place in Honduras, and what has their impact been? Two. What are the 21st century presidents of Honduras, sorry, how have the 21st century presidents of Honduras shaped the cultures that exist there, politically, 
culturally and economically. Three, think about why is violence against women so extreme in this country and so commonplace? And what were the links to the landscape? And four, which has had the greater agency in shaping the history of Honduras, people or nature? So we discussed that in the concept week, but I want you to really think about those ideas in relation to Honduras. And I look forward to discussing this very interesting, albeit dark topic in the seminar. Thank you.